I found my wife on the dance floor getting cozy with some guy. What they were doing hardly looked like dancing. Obviously, she had had too much to drink. I approached them, quickly pulled her arms off his neck, and started to lead her away. What's going on here, man? Snapped the guy she was dancing with. I'm her husband and we're going home, I told him. His initial readiness to resist me disappeared almost instantly. Take her. She's all yours, he muttered dismissive. She's no fun in bed when she's drunk anyway. I asked, and when she's sober, then she's fantastic, just ask around. Everyone agrees she's top-notch. Someone opened the door as I carried her to my pickup and drove to her parents' house. I laid her on her bed. She was already out of it, likely gone even on the dance floor. Without a word, I left. Ruth is my older sister, Esther Jacobs is the other. My brothers are Adrian and Henry Payne, and I'm Louis Payne, raised by Southern Baptist parents in Venori, Tennessee. We grew up attending church regularly with limited exposure to TV or radio, and our parents only read the Bible. We grew up in poverty, determined not to follow in our parents' footsteps. After high school, leaving Venori was our goal. Ruth and Adrian moved to Nashville, while Esther and Henry stayed in Madisonville. College wasn't an option for us. Ruth found work as an assistant cook in a diner, and Adrian, despite challenges in truck driving school, succeeded. With help from an instructor, he secured a job driving for a Nashville star, a position usually reserved for seasoned drivers. Adrian excelled as a truck driver with a great personality. After high school, I received a four-year Army ROTC scholarship to Vanderbilt University and was commissioned as a second lieutenant upon graduation. My first assignment was in Korea with the 8th Army, where I stayed for 13 months before returning home for a 30-day leave. I then reported to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. During my leave, I visited my family and spent time in Nashville with my sister Ruth. Adrian was on tour driving for a Nashville star. While staying with Ruth, I met Gerald Thompson, her boyfriend, and his sister Debbie. Debbie and I started dating, and by the end of my leave, we were in a relationship. Since Fort Campbell was close to Nashville, we spent a lot of time together. We had closeness on our fourth date, and it became a regular part of our relationship, and eventually we got married after 18 months. After our time at Fort Campbell, we were transferred to Germany. The move was a big change for us. Debbie joined social clubs, learned bridge, and we traveled throughout Europe. In the last months of our tour, Debbie developed a taste for European wine while I, raised in a household where alcohol was absent, never developed a liking for it. Our next posting brought us back to Fort Campbell, which made both of us happy. We settled into government housing and enjoyed about six months of contentment. Then Debbie began spending more time in Nashville. We'd visit for the weekend and she'd often want to stay an extra day or two. Those extra days soon turned into three or more. By the end of the year, Debbie was practically living with her parents. I would visit on weekends, and one Friday, I arrived early, only to find Debbie wasn't home. Her parents didn't know where she was. I had arrived right after lunch since I had finished work early. Debbie's mother explained that they hadn't expected me so soon. As I was about to take my overnight bag to Debbie's room, her mother tried to stop me. Give me a chance to tidy up first, she said. I replied, it's okay. The room was a mess, with dirty clothes scattered everywhere. I noticed that the bed was covered with dirty clothes, but appeared made and unused. It was clear the bed hadn't been slept in for a couple of nights due to the pile of clothes. Her mother was picking up some of the dirty clothes and kicked a pair of her underwear under the bed. I managed to get her out of the room by saying I needed to use the bathroom. After she left, I retrieved her underwear from under the bed. I found two more pairs and took them as well. One pair had what looked like white seed on them. I sat on the bed and examined them, but I couldn't bring myself to smell them to confirm. Taking them to the living room, I showed them to Debbie's mother, who had just finished a phone call. I held up the underwear and asked, How long has she been seeing other men? Her mother responded, I think that's something you'll need to talk to her about. I went back to the bedroom, grabbed my overnight bag, stuffed the underwear into a side pocket and headed toward the door. Her mother asked, Are you coming back? Not bothering to respond, I left and drove straight to Ruth's house. Although Ruth and Debbie's brother had stopped dating a few years ago, 
they remained friends. Since then, Ruth had married Eric Wyndham, who owned a music store. Debbie and I had returned to the States for their wedding. While heading to Ruth's place, I called her, and she told me where to find her hidden key. She was busy and couldn't chat but mentioned she wouldn't finish work until midnight since she had to close the restaurant that night. Once I arrived at her house, I tried calling Debbie but got no answer, so I left a message. This is your husband, the only man you're supposed to sleep with. I need an explanation for why that's no longer the case. I also want to know how many other men there have been and why. Eric came home around 7, and I filled him in on everything. Ruth called a bit after 8, informing me that her ex-boyfriend, Debbie's brother, had just heard from a friend that Debbie was drunk and flirting with several men at the Count of Monte Music Bar. He was heading over to pick her up and take her home. Ruth told him not to worry because I was already there and would handle the situation. When I dropped Debbie off on her bed, both her parents were present. Her mother began to blame me, saying that Debbie's actions were my fault because I took her to Germany, where she learned to drink and engage in all sorts of undesirable behavior. I glanced at them briefly, walked out, and returned to Ruth's house. Eric and I talked until Ruth got home, and then the three of us stayed up, talking well past three in the morning. I crashed on their sofa again. I woke up at seven, made myself a cup of coffee, and sat on their front porch, preparing myself for a conversation with Debbie. Ruth and Eric joined me around nine, and we continued talking for another hour. They wanted to know what my plans were, but I told them I hadn't figured it out yet. The next day, after ten, I rang the doorbell at my in-law's house. Debbie's father answered and let me in. Debbie was on the sofa, sipping a cup of coffee. Approaching her, I placed the stained underwear on her coffee cup. She picked them up, threw them on the floor, and took a sip of her coffee. I asked Debbie, why? Before she could answer, her mother interjected, you don't need to answer that, sweetie. Stay out of this, I replied coldly. Why, I asked Debbie again. She looked up at me and said, I needed to be loved, and you weren't around. How many times have you needed love and I wasn't here? I pressed. What, she asked. How many times have you cheated with other men, I repeated. I don't know, she responded. Take a guess, I urged. Maybe a couple of dozen, she said hesitantly. How many different men, I asked. I'm not sure, she said. Take a guess, I insisted. Six, maybe seven, maybe ten. I'm not really sure, she answered. Does our marriage mean anything to you, I asked. She looked up, stared directly at me, and took another sip of her coffee without replying. Walking out, I returned to Ruth's place and quickly told them what had happened. Did she show any remorse or offer an apology? Ruth asked. Nope, I replied. Wow, she's really cold-hearted, Ruth said. I thought the same thing, I agreed. With no reason to stay in Nashville, I decided to head back to Fort Campbell. On Sunday afternoon, I was surprised when Debbie walked into our house. I was lying on the sofa, and she sat on the armrest where my feet were. After a few minutes, she said, I'm sorry. Don't say another word. If your only excuse for cheating is that I wasn't around when you wanted closeness, that's pretty pathetic. You deliberately stayed away from home so I couldn't meet your needs. Instead of coming home to your husband, you chose to get drunk and sleep with strangers. That's a terrible reason to ruin a marriage. Your parents are just as responsible for this as you are, for letting you behave this way. The only thing left for you to do is pack your things and leave. I don't want to leave. I've apologized and promised it won't happen again. I don't care if it happens again. To me, we're no longer married, so you can do whatever you want with whomever you want. All I care about now is you leaving. I picked up the remote and turned on the TV. She snatched the remote from my hand and hit the mute button. I'm not leaving. You're my husband, and this is my house. She threw the remote back at me and walked out of the room. While she prepared dinner, I made a sandwich and ate it in the living room. She stayed in the kitchen and ate whatever she had cooked. When bedtime came, I took my shower and went to bed. She followed, took a shower, and tried to snuggle up to me as closely as possible. I turned away. Do you honestly think I would sleep with you after you've been with six or seven or ten other men? I apologized, she said. And you think that makes everything okay? Yes. You really need help. I can't stop you from sleeping in this bed. 
but I don't have to stay here and think about all those other men being with you. I went to the living room and slept on the sofa. When I woke up, she was sitting in a chair watching me. I ignored her, took my shower, shaved, put on my uniform, and went to work. After checking in at work, I spoke with my commander and updated him on what was going on. He advised, if I were you, my first move would be to see an attorney. Take all the time you need. That day, I consulted with several lawyers before choosing Kirby Dickinson. As a retired Army lawyer, he understood the unique challenges faced by military personnel. He asked, what exactly do you need from me and why? I need your advice because I'm completely lost. I replied, are you interested in trying to save your marriage? He inquired. No, I said firmly. Why not? He pressed. Because she cheated and I can't accept that in a marriage. How do you know she was unfaithful? He asked. I explained the situation to him. That kind of information doesn't hold much weight in court, lieutenant, he said, noting that I was now a first lieutenant. She could claim to have slept with the Army and Navy football teams in front of a packed stadium and then deny it in court, unless you have concrete evidence a judge might believe her story. He shook his head. Those are just the facts. After a pause, he continued. So since you don't want to save the marriage, I'm guessing you're looking for a divorce. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's right. I answered. And you probably want to make things difficult for her, correct? Yes, sir. You're right again. Great. I appreciate when clients agree with me. It reinforces what I already know. And what's that? I asked. That I'm a smart son of a witch, he said with a grin. We both laughed. Here's my advice, he continued. If she's living with you, give her the cold shoulder. Ignore her no matter how much she screams, yells, or throws things. Hopefully, she'll decide to leave either to go back to her mother, her boyfriend, or somewhere else. When she's gone, she'll probably return to her old ways and find someone new to sleep with. All we need to do is have someone there to record it. Even if the judge rules that we can't use the video, it will still show that you're telling the truth about her infidelity. I'm pretty confident that the court will rule in your favor. That's how it usually works in Kentucky. The downside to this plan is that we need someone available around the clock to film her activities, which won't be cheap. However, I'm confident this will benefit you in the long run. Are you on board with this? Absolutely, I replied. Good. First, write a check for my fee and then another for the private detective I'll arrange for you. Although I felt reassured, I also felt poorer when I returned to my office. That evening at six, Debbie called, but following Kirby Dickinson's advice, I didn't pick up. When I got home after ten, Debbie was there waiting for me. She asked, how long is this going to continue? I've apologized. Let's just go back to our normal life. Ignoring her, I headed straight for the shower. Twenty minutes later, as I settled into bed, I heard her car drive away. Getting up, I checked our shared closet and saw that most of her clothes were missing. I went back to bed and fell asleep. The next morning, I contacted Kirby Dickinson and informed him that Debbie had left, likely heading to Nashville. Excellent, I have connections there. Do you know where she might be staying? I gave him her parents' address. Perfect, let's proceed, he said. In less than a week, I received a video showing her with two men. Within 48 hours of receiving the footage, she was served with divorce papers citing adultery. Less than an hour after she got the papers, she called me, crying and begging for forgiveness. I ended the call without saying a word. I kept my boss updated on the situation. He had experienced something similar years ago. The key difference was that his wife cheated on him while he was deployed in a combat zone. Cheating on a spouse in a war zone is undoubtedly one of the worst betrayals. Next, I informed Post Housing that I was leaving the quarters. The following day, I moved into the bachelor officer's quarters, BOQ. Three days later, Debbie called saying she couldn't get into the house. I told her it was no longer our home. I had moved out because she had abandoned me, and as a single officer, I wasn't entitled to post housing anymore. But you're still married, she said. I chuckled and ended the call. I figured she'd probably head back to Nashville. As I've mentioned before, I don't drink alcohol. Growing up Southern Baptist, I never developed a taste for it, and that didn't change as an adult. The same goes for swearing. I never got used to using bad language. 
I don't mind if others drink or curse, but it's just not my thing. In the same way, I'm not a prude. Dancing closely with your partner is exciting, and seeing women in revealing clothes can be thrilling. I appreciate the female form, and if a woman wants to show it off, I'm definitely interested in looking. That night, however, I used every swear word I knew, and probably invented a few new ones, as I watched the video of my wife with two men. I played the video on my computer. It began with her dancing on a crowded floor with two men. They were behaving in ways meant for private spaces like bedrooms. She was occupied with both men, using one hand on each of their pants. The scene continued for several minutes before they left the dance floor, exited the building, and got into a car. The detective followed them to a rundown motel. He circled the area until he found a room with the window open. A couple was having closeness inside, but it wasn't the right one, so he kept searching until he found Debbie's room. Her window was also open and they didn't seem to mind. They quickly got undressed and got to the point. Watching my wife undress in front of two men felt like a strange dream, but it was nothing compared to what followed. Initially, I thought she might be drunk, but her words didn't suggest she was. Come on, guys, she said. Show me what you've got. I've never done this with two at once. It should be interesting. The taller man replied, it will, ho. You'll have more guys in and out of you than you could ever imagine. She paused and said, don't call me that. I hate that word. The shorter man stepped out of his shorts, walked over to her, grabbed her hair, and yanked her head back. You're a hoe and we'll call you that, he said. Pulling her hair again, he made her kneel. Now do what you need to do, ho. She reached for him and took it into her mouth. The tall man then grabbed her hair, pulling her off the shorter man. Now my turn, ho, he said. She complied. The short man said, ho do BJ, don't they? She kept continuing. He pulled her off again and repeated it. She nodded. You're doing my Johnson. What does that make you? A ho, she almost whispered. I didn't hear you. She repeated loudly. She continued to do that to both men alternately until the tall man pulled her toward the bed. Oh my God. She moaned and almost passed out. They lay side by side for several minutes before the short man spoke. That wasn't bad. Do you want more? Then two guys had her from both sides simultaneously. There were screams, but that didn't stop him. After a while, the screaming stopped and moaning started. Then she started moving. I pushed the pause button. I shut down my computer, feeling overwhelmed. Her behavior was beyond rational explanation. She claimed that her need for love drove her to cheat, but that excuse seemed one of the weakest ever given. When I confronted her, she didn't even try to deny what she had done. Her parents likely knew about her underwear I took and could guess what they revealed. They probably spoke to her first thing the next morning, so by the time I arrived, she was well aware that the truth was out. That week at work was a relief. Staying occupied from morning until night helped distract me from the disturbing memories of the video. On Friday, Kirby Dickinson called to inform me that we had a meeting scheduled with Debbie and her attorney on Monday. When I arrived, Debbie was accompanied by her parents. I asked Kirby to suggest to her attorney that it might be best if her parents were not present for the graphic video we planned to show. Kirby conveyed this to Debbie's lawyer, and I saw him discussing it with Debbie and her parents. Debbie was visibly upset and shook her head in disagreement. I overheard her saying, I don't believe them. It was clear that all pretense was gone. And as Kirby had put it, game on. The process moved quickly. Debbie's attorney requested that the adultery claim be dropped and replaced with a charge of mental cruelty. He argued that I had caused her so much emotional pain that she could no longer be around me, which supposedly justified her staying almost exclusively with her parents. Kirby and I exchanged glances. My computer, set up with the video cued to the precise moment I had paused it, was on the table. Debbie, are you certain you want your parents to see this? Debbie responded with defiance. See what? Me holding hands with someone? Dancing with him? Go ahead, show your worst. I pressed play, and the entire room witnessed the video. Stop it. Oh my God. Stop. Debbie shouted her screams echoing the same intensity as when she had been with another man. Her mother fainted, while her father tried to revive her, his eyes fixed angrily on Debbie. 
Once her mother regained consciousness, her father addressed her with a stern look. I want you out of our house today, he declared. It was clear that the revelation of her actions had changed their perspective drastically. He helped his wife up gently and began to leave the room. Pausing at the door, he turned to me and said, You didn't have to go that far, you know? Would you have believed me otherwise? I asked. Probably not, but surely there was a better way. There was, your daughter shouldn't have cheated, I replied. After that encounter, we never heard from them again. When it came time for the court date, neither Debbie nor her lawyer showed up. Six weeks later, I was officially divorced, retained all of our modest assets, and didn't have to pay any alimony. Another six weeks later, I received orders to deploy to a conflict zone in the Middle East. Before leaving, I spent two days with Ruth and her husband, then returned home to visit my parents and siblings. I left my truck at my parents' house for my father to use while I was away. Adrian was busy with another tour, and my other two siblings were still living in Madisonville, both married with children. My year in the Middle East passed with only a few troubling memories. Upon returning, I was promoted to captain, which was a nice boost. The next assignment sent me to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where I was given command of the garrison at the Command and General Staff College. This was a prestigious position for any captain, but being assigned there as a relatively inexperienced captain seemed like a mistake. I even called the assignment office in Washington, D.C. to double-check. Captain Payne, are you complaining? The officer asked. Because if you are, there are plenty of other captains eager to take your place. No, not at all. I'm very content. I just wanted to make sure I wouldn't be reassigned after a few months if someone noticed a mistake. I replied, Don't worry, Captain Payne, you're assigned here for three years, unless of course we need you back in the Middle East. If that happens, feel free to send one of those other captains you mentioned instead of me. We both shared a laugh over that. Adjusting to my new role didn't take long. Having an experienced first sergeant to handle day-to-day -day operations made things easier. One Saturday, I was at the post-auto repair shop. This place offered space and tools for minor vehicle repairs, and an expert mechanic was available to help if needed. I wasn't a professional, but growing up in the country had given me enough skills to manage basic repairs, like changing oil. When I got there, the shop wasn't busy, so I began changing my oil. The shop had three pits for working under cars. I was about five minutes into my task when another vehicle pulled into the pit next to mine. I didn't pay much attention until I heard a frustrated, feminine voice say, Goddamn piece of crap. The noise stopped briefly, only to be followed by a wrench dropping and hitting the concrete. Ouch! Damn it! Came the voice again. Amused, I decided to offer some help. I tightened the drain plug, climbed out of my pit and went over to the adjacent one. She was wearing coveralls that were a bit too large for her. Need some help? I asked. She glanced at me and I could tell that beneath the oil-smeared face she was probably quite attractive. Spitting out some oil, she said, Why do you assume I need help? Is it because I'm a woman and women supposedly can't change their own oil? Not exactly, I replied. It just sounded like you were having a hard time, so I thought I'd offer a hand. I appreciate it, but I'm fine. I know what I'm doing, I just really dislike this car. All right then, have a good day. I went back to my car added the oil and left, not seeing her again. The following week, I attended a cocktail party hosted by the commanding general. My invitation came because of my role as garrison commander, not because I mingled with the high-ranking generals and colonels stationed at Fort Leavenworth. With a coke in hand, I wandered around hoping to find other officers around my age and rank that I might relate to. I wasn't optimistic about meeting anyone and unsurprisingly, I didn't. Checking my watch, I realized I had about 15 minutes before it would be polite to leave. The backyard seemed like a pleasant spot to pass the time, so I made my way there. Just as I was about to exit the room, I overheard a voice. Anyway, Dad kept insisting that I learn to do things myself in case I ever got stranded, so I decided to change my own oil. It took forever, and I ended up covered in oil, from my hair to my fingernails, and even got some in my mouth. I spilled it all over the instruction manual, too, making it almost unreadable. But the worst part was when this incredibly good-looking guy offered to help and I turned him down. If I'd been smart, 
I would have asked for his name and number. Her group laughed. But then another woman asked, What do you mean you should have asked for his number? You've never done that before. I know. But there was something about him, something I can't quite describe. Even though I was frustrated, I felt something special. Wow, he must have been quite impressive. I think he was. I smiled to myself and tried to spot who had been talking. Curious about what she looked like without the oil. I stepped through the doors onto the patio and scanned the area. To my right, there were three women. One of them, who seemed to be around my age or maybe a few years younger, briefly met my gaze before I turned and went back inside. It was clear she recognized me. Finding a spot in the corner where I could observe without being noticed, I watched as the three women came in and headed straight for the front door. Typically, in military homes, there is a stand by the front door where visitors leave their calling cards with their name and rank. It's a common practice for military guests to leave a card each time they visit. The women approached the card tray and began sifting through the cards. They found one and huddled around it, examining it before looking over at me. I tried my best to blend into the background, but being the only company grade officer, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, or captain among a group of field grade officers, major and above, was rather conspicuous. Figuring out which card was mine wouldn't have been too hard. Since I was in uniform and the only officer below the rank of major, all they had to do was find my card among the others. Additionally, the nameplate on my uniform clearly read, Pain. Debating whether to approach her and mention her car, which would reveal my identity, or to wait and see how things unfolded, I decided to hold off. I hadn't had a when I felt it was the right moment. I made my way to the hostess, Major General Morris T. Woodley's wife, thanked her for the evening, and then retrieved my hat. It was easy to spot since it was the only one on the table without gold braid on its bill. Several times, I discreetly glanced at the three women, who were equally discreetly observing me. The intriguing woman and I had two things in common, the general's party and the auto repair shop. I couldn't linger at the general's house hoping she might appear, but I could certainly hang out at the shop. By Saturday morning, I was busy washing and waxing my truck at the shop. I was nearly finished when I spotted her car arriving. Instead of coveralls, she was wearing jeans and a white t-shirt adorned with gold glitter. While my truck was inside the building, she parked outside. As she got out of her car and walked toward the shop, a man I recognized as a major from the BOQ approached her. He began talking to her, and it seemed she was trying to escape the conversation, but he kept her engaged. Our eyes met for a brief second before I looked away. Since I was done and there were people waiting for my spot, I had to leave. Her gaze stayed fixed on me as I got into my truck and drove off. After pulling over to the side of the road, I waited. Within five minutes, I saw her driving quickly toward me. So I headed to the post exchange, PX, similar to Walmart. The parking lot was crowded, and I had to park quite far from the entrance. Reserved spaces close to the door included one marked for the commanding general, and I noticed her car was parked there. For a moment, I considered going home instead. Fortunately, I decided against it. As I entered the PX, she was standing right inside the door. Playing hard to get? She asked with a smile. No, ma'am. Why? Are you trying to get me? She burst out laughing. That's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Can you actually be won over? Probably, but I'm not exactly easy. Pointing toward the snack stand down the hallway, she asked, Would a Coke be enough? I chuckled. As long as you don't expect too much. At the snack stand, we each got a Coke. Hers was diet and she paid for both. We found a table and ended up talking for three hours without realizing it. Her phone rang at least six times, but she ignored each call. Finally, she checked her watch and jumped up. Oh no, I have a date. I need to go. I stood up. Now who's being elusive? We walked to her car, and she drove off to meet her date. Having not enjoyed a good meal in a while, I decided to head to the officer's club. Their prime rib was known to be outstanding. I went back to my BOQ, relaxed for a bit, showered, put on a civilian suit, and made my way to the club. The dining room was closed for a private event, but the grill was open so I decided to eat there. After finishing my meal, I started to leave and glanced into the dining room. In the doorway, dancing closely together, the major from the buck, and 
Wait, I realized I didn't know her name. Despite all our conversation, I had never asked, and she hadn't shared it. I stayed and watched them dance until they were jostled by another couple, and she looked over at me. Quickly, I turned and headed for the exit. Since the BOQ was a short walk away, I made my way there. The lobby had two large TVs, a bar, and a snack table frequently stocked by the officer's club. I settled in, had a Coke, and watched a NASCAR race rerun. After spending about two hours there, I was ready to head to my room when the major came in. He grabbed a beer and took a seat in a large chair close to mine. He struck up a conversation about the race and then asked, Aren't you the garrison commander? Yes, I am. He extended his hand. I'm Ernie Bigelow from Post G3 Operations. Louis Payne, I said, you already know where I work. We took a seat and started chatting. Ernie was easy to get along with, so after a bit, I mentioned that I'd seen him dancing earlier at the club. Your date seemed familiar. He laughed. That's because she is. She's General Woodley's daughter, Christina. Just curious. But is there anything between you two? I asked. He chuckled. No way, nobody gets close to Miss Iceberg. I've gone out with her a few times, but every time I think we're making progress, she shuts me down. Why do you keep trying, then? I inquired. Honestly, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm hoping she'll warm up, or maybe I just enjoy the challenge. He glanced at me. It's funny you asked about her, though. She saw you tonight and asked if I knew who you were. He laughed again. I didn't want to deal with more competition, so I told her I had no idea. Ernie Bigelow and I ended up becoming friends. Three days later, Christina Woodley called and invited me to dinner. I agreed to it. That evening, while sitting in the BOQ lobby, Ernie joined me. He looked at me and said, I hear you've got a date with Christina. Yes, Friday night. How did you find out? I called her to ask her out and she told me right away that she had a date with you, he replied. By the way, is it with who or with whom? Honestly, I was surprised myself, I said. She's usually pretty private with her phone number. Mind sharing how you got it? I don't have it. She never gave it to me, I explained. So how did you set up the date? You can't just show up at her door. I paused. I didn't actually ask her. She called me. I hadn't really thought about how she got my number. She must have used the calling card I left at her place and had access to the post telephone directory. Simple as that. He stared at me and then burst out laughing. Well, I'll be darned. I've known her for nearly two years and she's never asked a guy out before. You must be something special. I wouldn't go that far, I said. Let me tell you something. Christina does date, but it's rare. Since I've been around, she's only gone out with me and two other guys. We're a tight-knit group and keep tabs on each other, hoping one of us will make some headway. So far, all she shared are a few slow dances and a couple of pecks on the cheek. We continued chatting, and as mentioned, we had become friends. Ernie genuinely wished me luck with Christina. Just keep me posted and I'll make sure the other two know how things are going with you. Our dinner dates went well. In fact, they went so well that I kept asking her out. Ernie eventually found out he was being transferred to Korea and invited Christina for a farewell dinner. She turned him down, saying, according to him, I really like Louis, Ernie. I like him a lot. I don't want to mess things up. I always pick Christina up at her house for our dates, interacting with both her parents. They didn't seem to dislike me, but they weren't exactly warm or welcoming either. After dating Christina for six months, I had managed to reach what you might call second base, which for us meant touching her top. She mentioned that no one else had ever gotten that far with her. In the seventh month of our relationship, I got orders to return to the Middle East. I called my branch to confirm. I thought I was on a three-year stable assignment. I told the assignment manager. You were Lewis, but something must have gone wrong because we've been instructed to reassign you immediately. You need to be in country in two weeks. Two weeks? That's really quick. Everyone usually gets at least 30 days. I reached out to Christina, and she was even more distressed than I was. After talking for a bit, she ended the call by saying, I love you, Louis. She had never said that before. The next evening, I was packed and set to leave the following morning. Christina was coming over to say goodbye. When I heard a knock on my door, I opened it and found her standing there. She came into my embrace and we shared a kiss. My father did this, she said abruptly. Did what exactly? I asked. 
He's the reason you're being shipped out. Why would he do that? He knows how much I care about you, and he's afraid of losing me. Eventually, he will lose me or someone else, whether it's to me or another person. What do you mean by someone else? There's no one else right now. There will be if I don't come back. She held me tighter. Don't talk like that, she said. Then she pulled away slightly and looked at me seriously. Marry me. What are you talking about? Marry me. That will really get under his skin. I chuckled. Marrying me just to upset your father isn't a good reason to get married. She released me and sat down in a chair. Then I'll just stay here tonight. That would really drive him crazy. I laughed again. I'd love for you to stay, but after fighting with your father, where do you think the MPs will look first if you don't come home? Let's go to a motel off post then. I knelt in front of her. I love you too much to have our first night together be about revenge or hiding. It should be a moment we're proud of and want to share with the world. She cupped my face, kissed me, and laughed. I've already done that. Everyone at Leavenworth knows I love you, especially my father. That's why he had you reassigned. As we sat close together in the chair, the temptation was strong. It had been a long time since I'd had closeness, and here was a 26-year-old innocent girl ready to be with me. However, I wanted our first time to be special, and this didn't feel right. Our kissing was interrupted when her phone rang. Hello, Mom, she said, putting the call on speaker. Where are you? I heard her mother's voice. At the BOQ with Lewis? When are you coming home? Not until Lewis leaves tomorrow. She glanced at me with a smile. Her mother gasped sharply. You know your father will be furious, don't you? He's already done his worst, Mom. Having Lewis transferred was his way of hurting us. What should I tell him? Tell him that I'm an adult, and I'll make my own decisions. Goodbye, Mother. You realize that the MPs are probably on their way by now, I said. I don't care. That's easy for you to say since you'll just go home but I'll be the one facing jail time. She threw herself into my arms and we embraced and kissed passionately for a long time. Then she gazed deeply into my eyes. I love you, you know that. I've never been in love before. I'm aware that you love me too. Would you like to hear how I know? Yes, I replied. Aside from the two times you've touched me, you haven't tried to go any further. That shows me you respect me and aren't rushing things. We both understand that it will eventually happen. You will be the first man to make love to me. She began unbuttoning her blouse. Once it was fully unbuttoned, she slid it off. Then she reached behind her back and unclasped her bra, removing it without hesitation. Pulling me closer, she guided my head towards her. I had only touched her before, never kissed her. No one has ever done this before. She sighed breathlessly. I want you to remember this and come back for more. I kissed and gently sucked until I finally pulled away. We need to stop now, or we won't be able to stop at all, I said. I understand, but I didn't realize it would feel this amazing. She replied, breathless. She put her blouse back on but left her bra off. Just remember that these are mine. No one else should see or touch them. She kissed me and smiled. They're yours forever. Standing up, she picked up her bra and walked over to my duffel bag. Since I hadn't zipped it up yet, she carefully folded her bra and placed it inside. After looking at me one last time, she left, tears streaming down her face. The next morning, I was waiting for Major General Woodley when he arrived at his headquarters. I was there to open the door for him when his driver pulled up. He seemed surprised to see me, though he knew who I was. Why are you here, Captain? He asked. I'm here to tell you exactly what kind of a cowardly father I think you are. Sure, you might be a good general, but as a parent, you're failing miserably. You can send me anywhere you want, even to the federal penitentiary across the installation. But I'm going to speak my mind. I care deeply for your daughter, and she says she loves me too. That might be new to you because if I'm reading the situation right, she's never been in love before, and that terrifies you. You're worried that one day you'll lose her to another man. Could be me, Ernie Bigelow, a private in boot camp or some civilian doctor, but eventually she'll leave, and I hope it hurts you as much as you've hurt her by using your influence to have me transferred. When you see her at dinner tonight, I want you to remember that you've broken her heart, you've caused her pain, and she might forget about me over time, which I'm sure is what you want, but she will fall in love again and again. 
Each time she does, you'll lose a piece of her until you're left with nothing but her hatred. I didn't even give him a salute as I walked away. I fully expected to be stopped, detained, and thrown in jail as I left the post, but none of that happened. Instead, I drove to my sister Ruth's house, then on to visit my parents. I planned to leave my truck with them while I was away. I packed my few personal belongings into storage. I spent a day with Ruth. During my visit, she filled me in on what had happened with my ex-wife. Apparently, she was so obsessed with closeness that she turned to stripping and selling herself on the side. Her parents disowned her after they saw the video of her with two men and never spoke to her again once she moved out. Even Ruth's former boyfriend, who was her brother, cut ties with her. She had been arrested at least three times for escort and pills dealing and was currently in jail. After leaving Ruth's, I spent three days with my parents. I spoke with Christina multiple times before I left and learned that on the day I departed from Leavenworth, she moved out of her parents' house and into a furnished apartment in town, which really upset her father. She refused to talk to him, and according to her mother, he was torn between anger and hurt, so he felt both. When I arrived at the departure point and checked in, the sergeant behind the counter reviewed my orders, then excused himself to consult with someone in the office behind him. A few minutes later, he came back with a first lieutenant. Captain Payne, can you step into my office for a moment? The lieutenant asked. I followed him into his office. Please have a seat, Captain, he said, pausing to gather his thoughts. Your orders have been revised. It appears that the original orders were issued by mistake. Fort Leavenworth is investigating the issue, but here are your new instructions. You are to return to Leavenworth and resume your previous duties. He threw up his hands in disbelief. I've seen orders changed before, but never where a service member is reassigned back to their old position. On top of that, we received this yesterday by personal courier specifically to be delivered to you. The lieutenant handed me a sealed envelope with the return address of the commanding general, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Congratulations, Captain, you're going back home, the lieutenant said. Stepping outside, I opened the envelope. Inside was a brief note that simply read, You were right, signed Miss Sher Woodley. I quickly called Christina and she picked up on the first ring. Where are you? she asked. I'm heading home. Did you know they canceled my orders? No way, what happened? she responded. Seems like your father had a change of heart. I'm going back to Leavenworth. Oh my God. How soon can you get here? In a couple of days, I need to pick up my truck first. Then I'll drive from there. Come quickly, sweetie. I'll start looking for a bigger apartment. I made record time on my way back. We stayed on the phone for the last 50 miles, and she rushed out to meet me as I turned onto the street where her apartment was. The truck had barely stopped when I jumped out and into her arms. We kissed and hugged, oblivious to the traffic weaving around us. Military towns are used to these emotional reunions happening in unusual spots. After a few minutes, we managed to calm down and head inside, where we continued to kiss and embrace. Once we had settled down from the initial excitement, we sat together on her sofa and talked. She had spoken with her mother, but not with her father yet. Her mother didn't know about the change in my orders, but seemed genuinely pleased for her daughter when she found out. I showed her the brief note I received from her father. What does this mean? she asked. I explained what happened when I met him the morning I left. I'm amazed he didn't have you arrested for speaking to him like that, she said. Me too, I agreed. I bet it went against everything he believes in to change your orders, she said. He didn't do it for me. He did it for you because he loves you and is struggling to accept that he's no longer the only man in your life. Her gaze was filled with nothing but love. I looked back at her, stood up, and pulled out the ring I bought in Tennessee when I picked up my truck. Kneeling down, I held out the ring. Before I could say anything, she started crying. Christina Louise Woodley, will you marry me? Without hesitation, she dropped to her knees, extended her left hand, and said, put it on my finger. Once the ring was on her finger, she responded, yes, Lewis Hadley Payne, I will marry you and love you until the day I die. The kiss we shared was transformative. It resonated deeply within me, and I felt a certainty that I would spend the rest of my life loving her. Every man believes his partner is the most beautiful and perfect, 
and I was no exception. I suggested we stay at a luxury hotel for our first night together, but she declined. This apartment is our first home. I want our first night to be in our first home. She had arranged everything for my return, doing it in her own special way. For our first meal in the apartment, we enjoyed champagne, pate, and chocolate-covered strawberries. I even had some of the champagne. She wanted to enjoy a bubble bath before the evening began. After her bath, she emerged wearing a baby blue outfit that included underwear and a cover-up that perfectly complemented the ensemble. As she went about opening the champagne and arranging the pâté, I took a quick shower. When I entered the bedroom, I wore nothing but a bathrobe. We settled on the bed to eat and drink. Every now and then, we shared kisses. Gradually, the food was set aside as our kissing grew more intense until the tray of food was completely forgotten. Standing next to the bed, she undid the belt of my bathrobe. Holding the robe closed, she gazed into my eyes. This is the first time I've ever undressed a man, Louis. I always wanted it to be with the one I truly love, and that's you. People call me an ice queen, but I promise to be the best lover I can when you want me to be, she said. She gazed up at me and said, It's beautiful, Louis, and it's all mine. I've heard about women doing BJ, but I never imagined doing it myself. Now I can't wait. God, 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 this is amazing, Louis. I've never felt anything like this, she exclaimed. She started moving her hips up and down, matching the rhythm as I moved in and out. It was hard for me to believe that someone Christina's age could still be innocent, but witnessing her youthful enthusiasm was both exciting and enjoyable. By the time we were finished, it was around four in the morning. Her phone woke us up at ten. Hello, mother, she said brightly, putting the call on speaker as she usually did. Good morning. Have you heard from Louis? Shouldn't he be back today? Her mother asked. She flashed a wide smile at me. He came home yesterday and stayed with me overnight, mother. Her mother's voice brightened. Oh, really? That's wonderful news. He proposed to me and I said yes, Christina continued. Her mother's excitement was evident. That's fantastic. When are you planning the wedding? Christina chuckled. We haven't set a date yet. We were thinking we'd talk about it with you and dad at dinner tonight. Is that all right? Surprised by this news, I just stared at Christina, feeling a bit bewildered. She noticed and winked at me. That sounds great. What kind of wine does Louis like? Her mother asked. He doesn't usually drink, but he'll have a bit of champagne with us. Christina replied. Perfect. We'll see both of you at 630. Does that work for you? That's ideal. See you then. Should I tell your father about the engagement or would you prefer to do it? Her mother asked. You can tell him if you think he'll take it well. Otherwise, we can have Louis do it, Christina said. After ending the call, Christina looked at me and said, Make sure to take care of me, fiancé. It was a request I was always happy to fulfill. We arrived right at 630 and rang the doorbell. Her father answered. Why are you ringing the bell? You have a key, he said to Christina. I know, but I don't live here anymore, Daddy, she replied. I saw him flinch slightly, but his mood lifted when Christina hugged him and kissed him on the cheek. I heard her whisper a thank you as she kissed him. This was clearly going to be a tough conversation for him. He extended his hand for a handshake, which I took. Dinner is ready, so let's get started, he said. We were shown into the small family dining room rather than the formal dining area. Christina and I took our seats on opposite sides of the table and champagne was already poured. Daddy, Mom, Louis has something he wants to share, Christina announced. I took a deep breath and began. First, General Woodley, I want to express my gratitude for your help with getting my orders changed. I phrased it that way, fully aware that he was responsible for both the original orders and their reversal. Secondly, General Woodley, Mrs. Woodley, I want you to know that I love your daughter and have asked her to marry me. And I accepted, Christina said extending her hand first to her mother and then to her father. Her mother was overjoyed and beamed with happiness. Her father, clearly instructed to handle the situation gracefully, managed to maintain his composure and even proposed a toast. After the meal, Christina and her mother left to start planning the wedding. 
Meanwhile, the general and I went to the library where he poured us each a glass of port. I know you only drink on special occasions, and it looks like tonight qualifies as one, he said, handing me the glass. Congratulations, Lewis. You've achieved something I hoped I wouldn't see. After taking a sip, he motioned for us to sit. I always expected this would happen eventually, but he shifted his tone as he continued. You were right about me. I thought I knew what was best for my daughter, but seeing the way she looked at you during dinner made me realize how wrong I was. My only request is that you take care of her and love her forever, just as you do now. You can count on that, sir. I would never do anything to hurt her, I assured him. I believe you, he replied. However, there's one issue I'm struggling with. What's that, sir? I asked. I'm not comfortable with the idea of you two living together before the wedding, he admitted. It was clear Christina's mother had mentioned this to him. There's not much room for negotiation on that, sir, I said. I figured as much, but I thought I should at least mention it, he said with a sigh. Six months after that dinner, Christina's father retired and took on a new role as the CEO of a major auto parts division. Two months later, Christina and I were married. She was visibly pregnant as she walked down the aisle. My brother Adrian made an appearance with his Nashville superstar, who gave an unexpected performance at our reception. He also gifted Christina's parents with copies of all his CDs. Since my parents only listened to gospel music, Adrian brought them several copies of his gospel recordings. The day after we got back from our honeymoon, Ernie Bigelow gave me a call. He congratulated me and mentioned that he had won a thousand dollars from the other two guys who had dated Christina. They had bet him that I would mess things up like they did. But Ernie disagreed and ended up making some money. Two months after the wedding, we welcomed our son, Jason Richard Payne. Six months later, I decided to leave my military career and started working for my father in law. From the moment he could walk, Jason became very close to his grandfather. They were practically inseparable, and my father-in-law often felt envious when we visited my parents with Jason. During one of our trips to Tennessee, my sister Ruth updated me on my ex-wife's life. Her career was going well until she got caught mailing some of her work. The federal authorities don't tolerate that, so now she's facing a prison sentence of three to five years. One weekend, while Jason was at his grandparents' lake house, Christina and I had the house to ourselves. We were cuddled up on the sofa watching a movie. She turned to me and asked, Lewis? Yes. I replied, Do you enjoy being a father? Absolutely. Why do you ask? Would you want to have another child? I leaned back and studied her. Are you trying to tell me you're pregnant? She placed her hand on my lap and started rubbing it gently. No, but I would like to be.